As long as we're here doing rhetoric, we might as well talk about the guy who wrote the book. If you ever study rhetoric in school, you'll probably come across Aristotle's rhetoric because it plays a prominent place in many introductions to rhetorical history. That's because before Aristotle, philosophers mostly complained about rhetoric. In fact, Aristotle's teacher Plato even wrote about how rhetoric was sort of a cheap, fraudulent version of philosophy. And that's an idea that's still common today and has even shown up in one form or another in the comments section here. So I think that for a lot of people, Aristotle's rhetoric did a lot to legitimize the study and practice of rhetoric. Instead of just dismissing it, Aristotle took the time to understand it and to explain its usefulness and validity. And even though it's over 2,000 years old, there's still a lot in Aristotle's rhetoric that is useful and valid today. So I thought we'd take our first steps in discussing this ancient and interesting book, not just to know what Aristotle wrote, but to see why rhetoric is just as relevant in the 21st century. In the opening sentence of the rhetoric, Aristotle says that rhetoric is a counterpart to dialectic, which is about as straightforward and clear as it gets, so it's kind of weird that he kept writing. But it is a useful place to start the book, especially when we understand what dialectic is and who Aristotle's audience was. Aristotle is probably most famous for being a philosopher, like his teacher Plato, and dialectic was a method that philosophers used to determine what was and wasn't true. Of course, his audience was most likely students who were already familiar with philosophy and dialectic, so Aristotle chose to introduce rhetoric in terms of something that they already knew a lot about. For the rest of us though, dialectic involves two people standing on opposite sides of an issue or question, with one person asking the other a series of questions in order to test or challenge the other side's claims. It's a method of scrutinizing an idea through intense iterative questioning in order to figure out a clear, precise definition of something. For example, in Plato's Gorgias dialogue, we see the philosopher Socrates asking the rhetor Gorgias about what rhetoric is using a dialectical method like this. You can see, rather than just ask Gorgias to describe rhetoric, Socrates arrives at the conclusion through a series of questions. And in order to refine the definition of rhetoric even further, Socrates asks many, many more questions. Eventually, Socrates gets Gorgias to assert that rhetoric deals with the just and unjust and that rhetoricians must always be just. However, through that series of questioning, Socrates discovers a problem and he points it out by saying, I think at the time when I heard you saying so that rhetoric, which is always discoursing about justice, could not possibly be an unjust thing. But when you added shortly afterwards that the rhetorician might make a bad use of rhetoric, I noted with surprise the inconsistency into which you had fallen. And the dialogue goes on from there, but you get the basic idea of dialectic. A philosopher like Socrates asks questions about an idea following a strict and technical logical method, looking for inconsistencies or gaps in order to find an accurate and truthful definition of that idea. But for all the advantages that dialectic has for developing really exact and well-tested definitions, it also has some serious limitations that make room for the validity of rhetoric. Aristotle understood that rhetoric was like dialectic, but that it was built to do different things. So rather than just dismiss it, he acknowledged its value and set about explaining what it was and how it worked. And in a lot of ways, his rhetoric might be seen as an effort to explain and justify rhetoric to a bunch of philosophy students who might otherwise have dismissed it themselves. In particular, rhetoric sets itself apart from dialectic in three key ways which we'll discuss today. Its audience, its methodological strictness, and its overall purpose. As we've already talked about, dialectic is a tool for philosophers. You might even say that it's a highly specialized method to be used between and among experts. But Aristotle suggests that rhetoric is meant to be used among people who are not specialists or experts, and that's an audience that is especially relevant when you consider it in the context of early Greek democracy. For example, he explains that it would be possible to work through a lengthy dialectic process in the context of a democratic court where the judge and jury are fellow citizens, but he says that it would necessarily not be easy to follow because of its length, pointing out that the judge is assumed to be a simple person, or in other words, not an expert in dialectic. See, for whatever strengths dialectic has for arriving at clear and precise definitions, it also has several limitations that don't make it very useful in a democratic process. For one, it's a very long and potentially tedious process. If you're working with someone who's willing to sit through a battery of questions, fine. But if not, you might be in trouble. Simply put, everyday people probably don't have the time, training, or investment 
to put up with the dialectical method. Also, you might have a hard time finding someone who is willing to put up with your series of questions while you are also scrutinizing their every answer looking for inconsistencies. There's a reason that Socrates had kind of a reputation for irritating people wherever he went. You know, when you're working with an early form of democracy where, at least in theory, everyday people are making all of the decisions, it probably isn't a good idea to rely on a method that is tedious, that requires specialized training, and that has a high probability of irritating or offending the people you're trying to work with. In other words, dialectic is a great tool for doing philosophy, but it might not be the best tool for doing democracy. Specialized methods like dialectic require people to have specialized training in the method before they can participate. With rhetoric, though, the people involved don't need to be experts, so more people can participate in the conversation. Just imagine, for example, the kinds of conversations you might overhear between a group of people who maybe took a physics class in high school versus a group of Nobel Prize winning physicists who are all working at a large particle collider. It's not that one conversation is inherently better than the other. It's true that one may be less technical, but it will also be more accessible to more people. As we'll see in a second, rhetoric and dialectic have some substantive differences, but those differences grow out of the fact that rhetoric is suited to the context of democracy, where many people without specialized training are coming together to work out the problems that they all face. Dialectic involves a highly logical process, and it hangs on a structure known as the syllogism. In his translation of the rhetoric, George A. Kennedy points to one of the most famous examples of a syllogism. If all men are mortal, and Socrates is a man, then Socrates is mortal. In this, and all syllogisms, we have two conditional statements known as premises and a conclusion. When dealing with a syllogism, you have two statements that are known to be true that then allow you to draw a conclusion that is also guaranteed to be true by virtue of the truths that it grows out of. If the first two statements are true, then the final statement must be 100% true as well. There is no version of reality where men are mortal and where Socrates is a man and that you end up with a Socrates who isn't mortal. It just isn't possible. And the syllogism is a tool for arranging knowledge and testing its truthfulness. If you have a valid syllogism, or if the logical connections between all three steps are valid, then you have something that is absolutely true. But Aristotle explains that rhetoric works on its own kind of syllogism, which he calls the enthymeme. Again, Kennedy provides a good example. If Socrates is wise, he is virtuous. You might already notice some key differences here between a dialectical syllogism and a rhetorical enthymeme. For one, it's shorter. And why is it shorter? Well, for one, it's because a rhetorician can trust that the audience will understand the connections between virtue and wisdom without having to spell out every single logical step along the way. As Aristotle himself writes, if you wanted to say that Dorius had won a contest with a crown, it is enough to have said that he has won the Olympic Games, and there is no need to add that the Olympic Games have a crown as the prize for everybody knows that. And again, if we're thinking about the democratic process, there is value in keeping things short, trusting your audience to know about how the world works and sparing them the lengthy step-by-step -step tour of how you know that every statement you make is true. People have brains and we can trust them to use them. But there's another key difference between the parts of a syllogism and the parts of an enthymeme. Each part of a syllogism must be absolutely 100% true, but the parts of a syllogism are only probably true. And you might feel like one of Aristotle's students and wonder why on earth we would settle for something that's probably true if we had a method for figuring out what is 100% positively true. Well, in this case, I think it's helpful to remember that rhetoric is not about playing it fast and loose with the truth. Instead, it's about working through situations where 100% certainty is either impossible or impractical. Consider, for example, the relative complexity in confirming the truthfulness of these two statements. Socrates is a man, and Socrates is wise. Especially if we're willing to accept that man is a generic historical term for any human being, we aren't going to have to do much investigative work to confirm that Socrates is a human person. We can know his species with 100% certainty pretty easily. We can't really know in any quantifiable way, though, whether Socrates is wise. First of all, what counts as wise? If Socrates ever did a foolish thing in his life, would he still be wise? And how do we ever know whether or not he did something foolish in secret? We can't say with absolute certainty whether Socrates is wise in the same way that we can say that he is human. But we can also feel pretty comfortable calling him wise if we've seen enough of his behavior and character. 
When we say that Socrates is wise, there's probably room to debate that claim, but it's not really a controversial thing to say. It's likely enough that we're willing to accept it as true. And of course, that willingness to deal with probabilities is really helpful in a democracy. If you're trying to figure out whether to raise taxes or go to war or distribute medicine, 100% certainty about the right course of action is unrealistic. You could, I suppose, work through a formal process for discovering the absolute truth of the matter at hand, but first things first, you'd risk boring or confusing or irritating the voters, and more importantly, that process would take so long that the economy could collapse, the enemy could invade, or the sick could perish in the time that it takes you to get to your conclusion. So yeah, rhetoric doesn't approach truth with the same methodological formality, but that's because the real world often requires immediate action and will rarely slow down to give us time to consider the cosmic irrefutable truth. Aristotle famously explained that rhetoric gives us the ability to see the available means of persuasion in each case that we may encounter. And when we've talked about persuasion on this show before, we've mentioned how it's really meant to motivate people to take action. So a mastery of rhetoric means an ability to know in any given situation what would motivate other people to take a particular action. In contrast, dialectic and philosophy are more interested in figuring out what is true in an absolute sense. So the dialectical process can tell you that Socrates is 100% mortal, and the rhetorical process can tell you that Socrates is most likely virtuous. Rhetoric does leave some room for doubt, but there isn't a lot you can do with the knowledge that Socrates is mortal. If you're confident that he's virtuous though, that can do a lot to influence how you decide to interact with him in the future. So ancient philosophers and their modern counterparts worry about the fact that rhetoric doesn't go out of its way to ascertain absolute truth. But in all that worrying, they overlook the fact that rhetoric isn't really meant to figure out what is absolutely true. Instead, it's meant to figure out what is useful and then to motivate people to get to work. Dialectic is great for imaginary dialogues among dead philosophers or even for academics at a scholarly conference, but it's not very good for helping everyday people deal with real world issues in a democracy. For that, you need rhetoric. And in that light, rhetoric is not just a dereliction of our dialectical duty, it's a vital part of a healthy society. So I'm excited to talk with you about more of Aristotle's rhetorical insights, but I do think I've gone on for long enough today. There's more good stuff to get into though, so stay tuned and I'll see you then.